Well, hello everybody. Today I thought I'd try something different and welcome to Max's Models. And today we're going to be talking about Pyro and Palmer Plastics. And we're going to be combining these two because the companies are very intertwined. I thought I'd use my green screen and yes, I do in fact have a green screen in my garage. And we would try a slightly different format today and just see what you guys think. So off we go. The Pyro Plastics Corporation was in Union, New Jersey. And Palmer Plastics was across the river in Brooklyn, New York. Palmer was primarily a manufacturer of plastic toys normally sold in dime stores, sometimes in drug stores, candy stores, and the such. Any place that had your sundries and little toy aisles. Palmer's one of those companies that made those little green army men that we all played with. Where kit models were concerned, it was just a side job for Palmer. They made a lot of things out of plastics and kits were just one of them, so they were not a dedicated solely kit model maker. In fact, quite a few of their kits were just reboxed pyro kits. Palmer's kits that they made themselves really weren't considered to be all that in a bag of chips. They were geared towards kids. They were easy to build, although they did have the three-piece bodies, which could be a little tricky, but they lacked the deep detail that serious modelers wanted. That being said, they weren't very expensive. More than one Palmer kit met its fate at the end of a firecracker fuse. The original factory in Brooklyn was eventually knocked down to put up public housing, so they moved about a mile away to another factory, still in Brooklyn. But Palmer used a fairly outdated process. They did not use the modern side-slide method that George Todef had invented. And part of the downside of that, of course, was you were limited in what you could make. There were certain shapes and things you just couldn't make very well, so that limited the company. It also limited the rate of production. A lot of people felt that the Palmer kits were just, quite frankly, terrible, poor fits and the like. But they were budget toys, they were tabletop toys. A lot of people did not care for the multi-part bodies, but again, you're not paying a lot for it. Some of the kits were actually later reissued by Lifelike and then Lindbergh. Now Palmer also had two other subsidiary companies. It was the parent company to Winnico, and it was the parent company to Premier, or Premier's. Premier went on from about 1950 to 1963, and they made about 30 different kits, mostly cars, but they did do a few jets. And they also did a rather interesting one-to-one -one scale Luger pistol. That was fairly unusual at the time, something that Pyro would get into in a big way later on. Their subsidiary Winnico only lasted a couple of years, from 72 to 74, and it made about 30 different kits, uh, mostly cars and a few tanks. Pyro actually bought Palmer Plastics in 1970, but Winnico wasn't formed until 1972, so apparently, even though Pyro owned Palmer, it looks like they were probably still running it as an independent company. Although I think they moved them out of models and moved all the model kits over to Pyro and let Palmer just keep doing other plastics. Again, it's really hard to say. Usually, eventually, these companies wind up either shutting down the branch or merging it into one because you get these complex corporate structures, but without someone who was there at the time to tell me what was going on, I'm basically just trying to infer from what I can find out on the kits they made and the dates they operated. This takes us to Pyro. Pyro Plastics Corporation was founded in 1939 by William and Betty Lester. They established themselves as a leading contractor in custom-made plastic components. Now, like Palmer, Pyro used the injection molding method to form plastics, one that Lester had himself perfected, but over time it would become outdated. They would never really get into the side slide injection molding that George Todef had invented, so that was going to have an impact on them down the road, but for the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, they were doing okay. Like most companies during World War II, they put their abilities to helping the war effort, mostly making aircraft components. After the war, Pyro moved into toys. Now, you remember I mentioned those little green army men earlier? Well, Palmer certainly made a bunch of them, but apparently Pyro was the leader. It made more of them than anybody else. It made a lot of what they called bin toys. And if you're my age, you probably remember when you could go to a grocery store or what we used to call a dime store, and they would just have a bin there, and there'd be all these bags of toys. The Green Army Men, I think, were every little boy's favorite, except when they had cars. Some guys preferred the cars. And, of course, I had so many of those little Green Army Men that if you'd gone into our family room pretty much any time after lunch, it would have looked like the Anzio beachhead down there. Pyro became a big toy manufacturer in military toys about the time of the Korean War. But after that, everybody's attention was turning to space, and Pyro started making space toys. And the one toy that they made, now this was before my time, so I only know this from doing this research, 
But some of you who are older than me might remember, <clears throat> and I want to make sure I say this right, the Protomic Disintegrator Ray Gun. Apparently it became very popular and it stayed in production for a long time. Now, from the mid-50s, Pyro manufactured model kits covering a wide range of subjects, but they did not cut all of their own molds. When I was browsing Scalemates looking to do research for this, I found that a lot of their vintage airplanes were not originally their molds. They had gotten them from another company. Another thing about Pyro was when they built their ships, they didn't build them in any particular scale. In fact, some of them didn't even have a scale listed on the box. So you could have the world's most lopsided model navy if you were to build a lot of their kits which is kind of cool in its own right. Pyro manufactured model kits covering a wide range of subjects. These included automobiles, aircraft, ships, replica historic firearms, animals, dinosaurs, anatomical and educational models. Now this was all pretty innovative when it was first introduced. Now Pyro did develop license agreements with other model and toy companies in the late 50s. They would lend out their molds or they would borrow other people's. Also, as is frequently done in this industry, reboxing was a thing. Some of the companies that Pyro had mold swapping deals with include Lifelike, which ended up buying all their molds in the end, Lionel Trains, Impact, Otaki, and of course the previous mentioned Palmer Plastics. One of the things Palmer did, which is no surprise, is they made their military toys. They'd make a truck and they'd make it in OD green and they'd make a bunch of them. Ooh, mom, toy truck. And then they would take the exact same mold and shoot it in another color, yellow or blue or green, and sell that as a civilian truck. One of the kits that Pyro came up with was the X400 Space Explorer. Space is getting to be a big deal, and those who weren't making actual spacecraft from the space program were just making it up as they went along, and they came out with some pretty interesting stuff. Uh, from the late 50s, Pyro released a steady stream of larger ship models, and by 1967, they had nearly 30 of them. Obviously, since they were different scales, they never grouped them together. They also had ships from the Age of Sail, and they had a model of the Robert E. Lee Mississippi Steamboat that apparently was 21 inches long. The company offered an electric motor unit for ship models, so you could motorize your boat. One of the company's most unusual and interesting undertakings was its series of large-scale replica historic firearms. They made revolvers, flintlocks, they made a whole bunch of historic firearms, and I guess they sold because they made them for a while. Pyro also had a handful of architectural models and, of course, anatomical subjects like the human eye. They also did the heart, the ear, the lung, and these were not the old Renwall kits. This is stuff they made on their own. They did a 1-8 scale series of characters. Uh, they had the Indian warrior, the Indian chief, the medicine man, cow puncher, a deputy, Wyatt Earp, the Neanderthal man. I remember seeing these characters. I don't think I ever bought one, but I do remember seeing them. They even did birds, ducks, a ring-tailed pheasant. Those are some pretty off-the-wall stuff, and it's a lot of work to make a mold, so I'm assuming they sold some of them. Well, Pyro had bought Palmer in 1970, but two years later, he went ahead and retired. And this may be why the follow-on management may be the ones that started Winnico that only went from uh, 1972 to 1974. Technically, Winnico was under Palmer, not Pyro. Everything has a reason, but that reason is often invisible, especially 60 years later. Bill Lester wanted to pursue other things in plastics. Now, why anyone would want to leave the glamorous kit model industry, I don't know, but he wanted to go into working on tamper-proof bottles. Bill Lester sells Pyro to Lifelike Hobbies. Eventually, Lifelike would wind up selling the toolings to Lindbergh. Lindbergh would reissue some of them, then Lindbergh would change hands several times. It would wind up with J. Lloyd International, which in turn would be sold around to, and that's where they are today. So the molds are still around, and they m might even be still being made, or at least they could be. Bill retired a few years later, moved to Delray Beach, Florida where he lived a long and apparently happy retirement, engaged largely in photography and golfing. In 1986, Bill was inducted into the Plastics Hall of Fame. He passed away in 2005, Delray Beach, at the age of 97. Well, what was your experience with Palmer, Pyro, Winnico, or Premier's? Or for that matter, lifelike? If you got anything to add, let me know. Put it in the comment section below. 
And if you do have any information on Lifelike, I'd like to hear it because I'm hoping to put a video together on them before too long. Well, folks, this is Max. We'll see you on the next one. Ciao. Spreading the news I'm leaving today I want to be a part of it In New York, New York This vagabond truth Are longing to stray Right through the very heart of it New York, New York I want to wake up in a city that never sleeps To find I'm king of the hill Top of the list This little town are melting away I'll make a brand new start of it in old New York if I can make it there I'll make it anywhere it's up to Wager, although I don't know this, but I'll bet if you're a big fan of science fiction movies, the old B-roll black and white movies, it would not shock me to see one of these things actually being used as a movie prop, which did happen with plastic toys from time to time. And of course, being the kind of kid I was, an altruistic little snot. Mom, where's the green spray paint? Max needs his convoy. It was a dark of the moon on the 6th of June, and LST hauling guns. We was heading off to Normandy Beach. We's gonna have some fun. Tamper-proof bottles. Giving up models for bottles. Mm. Things that make you go... Uh, so... So... He was active in photography and golfing because there's nothing more grown up than running around beating the crap out of a little white ball with a stick. Go in the hole, go in the hole! Okay, that didn't sound right. Um, where, like most retired men, he took up golfing. 
because there's nothing more mature than chasing a little white ball around a green field with a big iron stick. Uh, I'm judging. I'm judging! I did not know there was a Plastics Hall of Fame. This is a thing I did not know, but now I know.